Morning, everyone. Um, could I just ask all our panelists and speakers to uh, just turn on their their sound and their video, please? Hi, Dara. Just checking you can hear us. Yeah, all good, James. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Great, we'll, we'll kick off. Um, so um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Enterprise Ireland Offshore Wind Showcase. Thanks for joining. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Dara Cotter, and I'm a Senior Market Advisor um, for, Enterprise, for Enterprise Ireland based in our London office, uh, together with my colleague Liam Kern, who you can see on the, on the screen here as well, uh, a Senior Technologist based in our Shannon office. Uh, we coordinate the work of the Enterprise Ireland Offshore Wind Cluster. Um, I should mention, for those unfamiliar with Enterprise Ireland, that we are the government organisation responsible for the development and growth of Irish enterprises in global markets, and that we have offices in over 40 countries around the world. The cluster was officially launched in early 2019 and, and today comprises over 50 member companies. The cluster is a key vehicle through which the Irish supply chain engages with offshore wind developers top tier contractors and OEMs in Irish, UK and global markets. Today, we will be introducing you to four of our leading cluster companies, XOcean, Gavin and Doherty Geosolutions, Exceedance and Villacom. Ireland's innovation focused offshore wind supply chain is helping to accelerate the growth of offshore wind globally. From IoT, wireless communications and data analytics, to geotechnical expertise and marine civil and electrical engineering, Irish companies offer flexible and solutions-based services, always focusing on future trends, industry challenges, and technology needs. Today is the first in a series of online company showcases, with more to follow in the, company in the coming months to highlight additional Irish capability and industry experience. Our, ne our next showcase will focus on the Irish expertise in the area of ports and harbours, a key enabling element of the offshore wind industry. We'll be sure to keep you up to speed on details over the coming weeks. As mentioned, today you'll hear from James Ives, CEO of XOcean, Paul Doherty, Managing Director of Gavin and Doherty Geosolutions, Ray Alcorn, CEO of Exceedance, and Adrian Mulholland, Director and CFO at Villacom. Um, please note that there will be time at the end of each presentation for questions. You can submit your questions via the questions tab on the sidebar, which should be visible to the right of your screen. Um, before we move on to our first presentation, I should mention that Enterprise Ireland and seven cluster members will be exhibiting virtually via an Ireland country pavilion at Global Offshore Wind between the 28th and 30th of October, which is next week. If you are taking part in, in Global Offshore Wind, please do get in touch with me or with Liam and we'd be happy to schedule a one-to-one -one virtual meeting at the event. Lastly, if you have any further queries regarding Irish capability or wish to speak to any of the companies presenting today, please do get in touch with us and we'll be more than happy to connect you or to answer any questions. Uh, Liam, would you like to add anything at this point before we kick off? Yeah, just very briefly to say hello to everybody and uh, just to reiterate what Dara said there, you're going to hear from four great Irish companies in the sector. Um, in terms of what's happening in Ireland, uh, and I know that's of interest to people, um, we're looking effectively at two timelines, um, in the next 10 years and the following 10 years. Within the next 10 years, what we're primarily looking at is, is seven projects in the Irish Sea, potentially fixed, uh, and they're critical to delivering the 70% renewable electricity target by 2030. 2030 to 2040 looks primarily like uh, floating offshore and um, Celtic Sea and Atlantic Coast. Um, and we have, uh, that's not to say, by the way, that, that floating um, won't be happening in the next 10 years. People like Simply Blue are, are looking at uh, deploying devices within the next 10 years in the Celtic Sea. Uh, but we also have some interesting innovation starting to happen in that space. We have two companies um, on the innovation side who are testing load reduction devices in real world scenarios um, for uh, 
uh, dynamic mooring systems for floating offshore wind. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting development. Um, we're also beginning to see the Irish capability around IoT and comms and ICT that Dara spoke of there increasingly focusing its capabilities on offshore wind and uh, bringing to the picture things like interventionist solutions and so on. Um, so that's it for me. Um, happy, as always, to link up any uh, anybody with uh, queries around Irish capability with relevant companies. Um, back to you, Dara. Great, thanks, Liam. Okay, um, and just to mention that um, obviously everyone is muted apart from today's speakers. So again, if you do have questions, please submit them via the questions tab on the sidebar. And myself and Liam will relay these at the end of each presentation. Um, so if I could ask everyone but James to uh, mute themselves and turn their camera off, we'll, we'll get going and I'll hand you over to your first presenter, James Ives, CEO of XOcean. Brilliant. Look, thanks, Dara, and thanks, Liam, for uh, for hosting today and organising it. So, so yeah. So, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what XOcean is doing in offshore wind. It's a market that we see, uh, you know, huge potential in, and is a market that we're we're spending more and more time on. So, if we jump to the first slide, if possible, please. Um, so today, I'm just going to cover three areas. First of all, just a little bit about uh, XOcean. What is it that we do? Um, to talk a little bit about the technology that we, we use to collect data, and, and then most importantly is to focus on some of the data sets that we collect on offshore wind farms. So if we jump straight into the next slide. So we, are, we see ourselves primarily as a data company. We, we collect data for a range of different uh, users, so surveyors, companies, agencies. Um, but we do it with a different, so rather than using a conventional vessel with a crew on board, we're, we've developed an unmanned system um, to collect this data, an unmanned surface vessel. And, and we see really three key advantages of using technology like this for ocean data collection. Uh, first of all, and, and primarily is safety. Uh, we don't require personnel to go offshore, so that removes obviously a key risk. Um, environmentally, we, we have around about a thousandth of the emissions of a conventional survey vessel. So we, we can really reduce the carbon emissions on, on data collection. We actually go a step further and we offset any project related carbon uh, from our project. So effectively the data we're delivering is, uh, is carbon neutral. Um, and ultimately, it, it, also the economics are important. So we believe we can deliver savings over the conventional alternative in collecting that data. I guess what's interesting is when we look at our customers, these three objectives are often the three core objectives of, of a lot of the customer base that we work for, uh, safety, environment, and economics. So there's good alignment there. If we go to the next one, please. And so who, who are our customers? So we, we, we work with a, a quite a wide range of different uh, users. So everything from oil and gas companies like BP and Shell and Total, uh, government agencies, um, and then through to industrial groups. And that's predominantly, I would say, driven by offshore wind. Uh, so we've done quite a lot of work for people like our uh, uh, SSE Renewables, Energy, uh, Diamond Transmission. And, and we operate globally. So uh, traditionally, we started mostly around, around UK waters, but that's now grown into, say, Norway, Azerbaijan, uh, out into the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico and Canada. So, so really quite, quite global. And next, please. So just talking about the technology. Um, the, the system we've developed, it's probably best described as being around the size of an average car, about half its weight. It, the system was designed primarily around the sensor payload, so making sure that we can carry commercial grade sensors so that they could be quite power hungry and also, also quite large in terms of mass. So we designed the system around carrying high quality survey systems. And the other crucial thing that we were aiming for, and this is very relevant to offshore wind farms, is the ability to operate over the horizon. Uh, one of the one of the trends we're seeing in the industry is for wind farms to get further and further offshore. Um, so our system operates uh, through a satellite connection. So we would launch it onshore. Um, we then transit it uh, remotely uh, from from its launch place to the site, operate there for several days, weeks if we require, and then return it. So there's no requirement for a mothership or a line of sight to land. So if we go to the next slide. 
In terms of the vessels that we have, we, we currently have nine of these vessels in service. Uh, they're split between Europe and North America at this time, and another two in production. Um, so we're seeing that, uh, that we're needing to grow the fleet, and we're starting to see the requirement to base our vessels close to project locations so that they're on call at very short notice to perform survey operations. Next, please. Thank you. And yeah, talking about the survey systems, uh, as I mentioned, for us, it's really important that we're, that we're carrying the, the, really the top end commercial grade uh, sensor equipment. Uh, in this example, you can see an RT Sonic 2024, actually two of the high resolution units. Um, these, this is specifically for looking at cables and pipelines. Uh, we can also deploy sound velocity probes so that we can uh, we can correct for the sound velocity in water. So we're really carrying exactly the same high-end survey equipment that would be carried on a survey ship, but obviously in a much much smaller package. Next slide, please. And then looking at the control of the system. Um, this system is probably best described. It's not an autonomous system. It's it's a it's a remote system. So the vessel is offshore, and it can be hundreds of kilometres offshore in the central of the North Sea, for example. It's connected via a satellite connection to to effectively what we call a, a USV pilot, and the USV pilot is a, is is the skipper. They're responsible for managing the vessel. They're responsible for collision avoidance. And to do that, we feed that pilot with a, with a number of data feeds. So they get live camera images from the vessel. They get uh, situational awareness data, such as AIS traces from surrounding vessels, uh, the, the, the chart uh, data, and so on. And they're responsible ultimately for the vessel. However, what we also then have is, is surveyors. It's essential that we have surveyors that are also monitoring the quality of the data that's being collected. And, and that's making sure that when we, uh, when we process the data, we've got a full data set of, of the information required. So talking about offshore wind, um, really, when we look at offshore wind, we see an industry that requires data really from the very first day to the very last day of a very long project life cycle. Um, typically, we might be looking at, say, a 30-year project life cycle, which would cover the initial planning and development phase, then maybe two years of construction, you know, 20, 25 years of, of operations and maintenance. And ultimately, at the end of that, there's a period of time when either that wind farm will be decommissioned or it will be repowered with, uh, with new technology. So, and throughout every one of those phases, data underpins the decisions that are made and the analysis performed on the wind farm. So we can go to the next slide. And, and I guess looking at some of the wind farm sites that we've operated on, and I'll give you some examples of the types of data sets that we've collected from these sites. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've worked across a number of different sites at this stage. So sites such as Galloper and Greater Gabbard, but very strong tidal areas quite, quite a long way offshore. Um, uh, Gwenty Moore off the Welsh coast, uh, 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 Burbo Bank, uh, the Walney extension, and each of these sites have their own characteristics. Some are in relatively shallow water, some are quite far offshore, some have got very tidal areas, some are exposed to, to, to North Sea conditions, um, and each of these projects uh, require the data that we're going to talk about now. So if we move on. So the first data set to share with you is really around wide area surveys. And these surveys are typically performed at say the beginning of a wind farm's uh, development life. Um, so we're talking about very large area surveys, so 500 kilometers square plus. Um, and what we're looking at there primarily is the seabed uh, bathymetry, so the shape of the seabed, and also looking at uh, using some techniques such as sub-bottom profiling to understand some of the composition of the seabed. And this data is used for things like uh, planning cable routes. It's used for uh, uh, deciding on positioning of turbines. And that may be before a geotechnic campaign will go in and actually take you know, physical core samples and, and get into detail. Um, when we're doing these types of surveys, because they're such large areas, one of the techniques we've used uh, really effectively is actually using multiple vessels. Um, so we recently completed a 420 square kilometer survey in, in quite shallow water between 10 and 30 meters. And, and for that, we used up to four USVs. Uh, and that meant that we had effectively four sensors on site at one time. And that allowed us to rapidly collect the data for that client. Next slide, please. 
And then once we once the, the turbine has been installed, there's a requirement to not only understand has the installation uh, proceeded as planned, but also then to inspect the the installation over a period of time. And again, we're using multi-beam echo sounders here. And, and one of the key things we're looking for is things like scour. So checking that there isn't any erosion from either tide or wave action around the base of the foundation, making sure that subsea cables haven't become exposed and, uh, and, and understanding, you know, checking there's no debris on the seabed. Um, so this is a this is a survey that we we find that we perform quite regularly on on a number of turbines and and it all depends on the i guess on the how mobile the seabed is and how often those surveys need to be performed next slide please another type of survey that we uh, we look at as well is is when a construction vessel is required onto site um, so if if an intervention is required on a turbine there's often a requirement to bring a jack up vessel in um, before that jack-up vessel can be sighted, there's a requirement to perform a survey around the, the base of the foundation, usually around a 200 or 500 uh, uh, meter uh, square around the foundation. And that gives the information required to the operator of the jack-up so they can position the, themselves safely. Uh, and I think interestingly on this image, you can actually see, uh, you can see where the cable is, you can see where the turbine foundation is but you can also see the four marks that left from when you probably when the, the the turbine was originally installed from a jack-up vessel and so this information is really useful for the for the construction service provider when they're looking to come and intervene with a turbine next slide please and getting into a little bit more detail here um, I, I think one of the one of the key elements of a wind farm as well as the foundations is is the cables so the interarray cables that connect the turbines up and then also the main export cable to shore um, again we're using similar techniques here to collect this data um, so using primarily multi-beam echo sounders to be able to look at the surface of the of the of the seabed and on the left hand image uh, I, there's a this is a really good image of showing a slice through a a, a turbine foundation and what you can see on the left and the right hand side of the foundation is actually the cables that are coming out of the base of the the foundation and then then going in into the seabed um, so this data is really useful for the engineers that are looking at the integrity of the, the cables and the foundations and, and understanding how they're evolving over time but that's very much on the surface we then can also use sub bottom profiling to look under the surface um, and that's on the right hand side image here so the, the little graphic at the bottom is showing the track that the the unmanned vessel takes so uh, when we're looking at a cable we basically perform a series of cross lines very much like a like a railway track uh, we're crossing the the cable at, uh, at at intervals and while we're doing that we're using a sub bottom profiler to penetrate into the seabed and and to, to try and detect the cable and see how far it is buried underneath the surface. This is really useful again for understanding how the wind uh, the wind farm is 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 developing over its lifespan. So, for example, we can see if over time the cable is getting shallower and shallower. Well, there's a there's a risk that the cable might become exposed at some point. Um, so here we can continually monitor the cable and make sure it stays at a, at the right depth of burial. And, uh, and that information, as I say, is, is really crucial for the integrity engineers to understand how the wind farm is developing. Um, these, uh, these surveys can, can actually take a, a huge amount of time because there's multiple crossings required to, to fully map the, the cable. And, and actually, it, it lends itself very well to an unmanned vessel, particularly a small vessel, um, because the turn between each of these lines can be very tight. There can be not very much space between each of these crossing lines, and it's a great uh, it's a great use of an unmanned system. If we can move on to the next slide, please. And then as moving maybe to the other end of the cable, so where the cable comes ashore, again, there's a requirement to continually inspect that and monitor the uh, not only where it's going to be installed first off, but then also managing how it how it ages through its life. Um, and here we're using. Two, two different types of unmanned system to collect this data. The technique that we use is at high water, we do the, the marine base survey. So the USV has got a relatively shallow draft, so less than a meter. So we're able to come in at high water, very close to the shore and survey the area 
um, in that intertidal zone and, and collect the, the seaborne data set. What we then do is at low water, and this is really good, particularly during spring tides when you have a big tidal range, we then use a, an aerial uh, drone, an, a, a UAV, to fly over the same area. And it's using then uh, photogrammetry to collect the, the bathymetry uh, of, the, of the intertidal zone and also the onshore sections. And, and effectively what we create then by doing it at the two states of tide, we create a data set that's overlapping. Um, that data set can then be stitched together and then it ultimately results in a, in a, in a data set that's really going from uh, you know, the right offshore, right the way up through the intertidal zone, up the beach and then onto the onshore sections. Uh, and these, these data sets are, are really powerful when you're visualizing how a cable is coming ashore, either for a wind farm or for a utility, an interconnector. Um, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're really, really useful data sets. And then if we can move on to the last slide um, and around some of the future developments that we're working on to support this industry. Um, I've just got three examples here. The first one is a project that we're involved in, which is the RAPID uh, Consortium. And what this is looking at is using the unmanned system, the unmanned vessel as a platform for aerial drones, aerial drones that can then be used to perform topside inspections. Um, and what the uh, unmanned vessel is able to provide is not only a platform for landing and launching the, the, uh, the, the drone, it also provides a, a connection, a data connection and a charging station for the unmanned drone. So that's really bringing two types of unmanned systems and coupling them together. We're also looking uh, at, uh, which is of a lot of interest, is using the unmanned platform to support uh, to support the bird and marine mammal observations. So uh, using techniques such as uh, sort of hydrophones, uh, surface cameras, um, AI techniques to basically supplement the marine mammal observations that are required you know, either during you know, pre-consenting stages, during construction phases uh, and beyond. And we see the platform as a great way of collecting this type of data. And the final thing that uh, we're looking at at the moment is, is also using the USV as a platform for other, other sensors such as uh, camera sensors that can do things like blade inspections from the water. So uh, collecting very high definition images that can then be used to do analysis on, uh, on blades uh, without the need to send a human offshore and to scale the, the turbine foundation. So, um, so that's just a very quick snapshot of some of the things that we're developing uh, in this space. And I think that's my last slide. So uh, I hope I haven't gone over time there and happy to take any questions anybody's got. Thanks, James. Uh, you're, you're spot on with time there. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we, we we have had a few questions coming in, James. Um, first one there, um, James, very interesting. So a compliment to start with. Um, does XOcean have capability to scan for UXO, so um, unexploded devices? Or yeah, so so we uh, so typically you're looking at using a magnetometer to to do that detection. Um, we, we currently have hull mounted magnetometers that we've used actually over in the Gulf of Mexico, but that's really limited to quite shallow water. Um, we, we, had, we do, however, have a development in the pipeline, which is uh, what we're calling our G2 vessel, uh, which is a slightly larger USV, which has the ability to tow both a side scan sonar and a, a conventional magnetometer spread. That vessel is actually undergoing sea trials before the end of this year, so we expect to have that available for, for next season. So, uh, so the answer is it's we can do shallow water, and we're now moving towards being able to do the deeper water from next year. Excellent, great stuff. Um, I just actually want to ask you about um, your UAV or your drone capability, the ability to overlap the data from the USC. Um, have you managed to to do that in practice already? Is that something that um, you've been able to uh, show works on, on a practical side? Yeah, we, we've actually done, uh, done, we've used that technique on a number of projects. We've used it for some civil hydrography work where, where we're mapping the seabed for, for chart data, but then also using the aerial drone to get the, the topography along the shoreline. 
Uh, we've also used it a lot with utility companies where uh, either are in, in islands, uh, such as up in Scotland, where you've got uh, cables that are connecting each of the islands together and actually being able to uh, basically scan both the, the, the offshore element and then how that cable comes up the beach. So we've, we've used it uh, across a number of different industries. It's, it's very effective. The, the, the aerial drone is able to collect the data extremely fast, um, much faster than the, the waterborne vessel. Um, but yeah, bringing the data sets together is it, it's very powerful. Great. Um, a question here, James, as well about um, weather downtime, which is obviously a major consideration for the offshore wind industry. Um, how do your vessels compare to uh, traditional vessels in terms of um, weather enforced downtime? Yes, it's a really good question. Um, what, what we're typically finding is, is that the, the USV is able to continue surveying longer than typically the conventional vessels do. Uh, as, a, as an example, uh, we, we collected data around the Greater Gabbard offshore wind farm um, earlier this year. We were, we were operating when actually all the conventional vessels, uh, all the crew transfer vessels departed the site. There were sort of three meter plus wave heights there. 30 plus knots. It, it was a really, really foul day. Um, so operations on the site were suspended, but we were able to continue. And also we continued 24 hours a day. So uh, so we were able to collect data sets and actually very, very, very high quality data in that instance that uh, that we were able to verify afterwards. So yeah, we've collected data in, you know, four meters plus uh, waves in uh, off places like Trinidad, where you've got big, uh, big Atlantic swells. So so yeah, we, we generally can push on a bit further than a conventional vessel can. Right, uh, you've, you've answered my next question there. The next question came in is what sea space can the vessel operate in? But uh, I, think, I think we'll cover that one. Um, I think it's fair to say as well that, that um, apart from weather downtime, you know, obviously we're, we're going through a pandemic and there's been, especially earlier in the year, there was some restrictions on, on, on people getting out to sea and getting to work. And I guess that's where uh, your capability really came to the fore as well. You actually were able to deploy during um, the earlier months of the pandemic, isn't that right, James? Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, Shell actually wrote an interesting article on their website uh, just recently about the use of unmanned technologies during the COVID, uh, COVID uh, crisis, particularly initially in the first lockdown when, when really everything was locked down. We, we were actually able to complete a project on the Ormond Langer gas field off Norway uh, without a single member of our team leaving their home in Ireland. So we, we, we shipped the USV by, uh, by freight to Norway. We then used a local contract to launch it for us, and we then then went on to the Ormond Langer site. And we were we were uploading sensor data in about 1,100 meters of water, about 120 odd kilometers offshore. Um, what was re or even more interesting there is that our pilots were in Ireland, the specialists for the sensors were in the UK, the geologists for Shell were in uh, in Norway and in Houston. And everybody was be, was able to be connected to the project without anybody actually leaving their home. The, the only person that got wet was the was the USV. Great stuff. Um, I think we've time for one more question. I'm sorry, there are, there are plenty more questions coming in, but um, just in the interest of time, we'll um, we might have to move on. But just a question on cost, James. Um, how does the cost compare to conventional um, hydrographic surveys? It, it it does very much depend on a, on the project by project basis. We, we we tend to be most competitive when the projects are are more than sort of 24 hours of duration because we stay out. Once we're offshore, we stay offshore and we operate 24 hours a day for several days. Um, but but we're anywhere between this is what we understand from the market anywhere between a third to two thirds of the price of a conventional survey. As I say, it does depend on the payload, the type, the duration, the location. But typically, we would we 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 look to be a lower cost than a conventional alternative. Great. Listen, James. Thanks very much for your, your time this morning. I I think we keep going for another ten or fifteen minutes with questions. But um, as I said, what, what we can do is we can um, send those questions on to James, and we can, we can let you know who's asking them, so that you can maybe uh, respond directly after. After today's showcase, that's, today's that's great. Showcase. So, uh, thanks, Dan. Thank you again for your time, James. Um, I'll just ask you to you can turn off your audio now, and, and thanks very much. Great, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, um, we have Paul Doherty, managing director with Gavin Doherty Geo Solutions. Um, Paul, can you can you hear us?
more to the point can we hear paul um just one moment Okay, I think Paul might be having some audio um, issues at the moment. Um, what we might do is while we're fixing uh, or, or sorting out Paul's audio uh, problems, we might, if it's okay with Ray Alcorn, to put him on the spot and, and just move forward to um, Ray's presentation. Ray is CEO of Exceedance. Um, Ray, is that okay with you? Great. Yep, stuff. no I'm problem at all. Well, in the meantime, we can um, fix your um, audio issues and refer back to you after Ray's presentation. If that's okay. This is the um, realities of um, <laughs> webinars these days. So thanks, Ray. Uh, I think everybody's used to it these days. <laughs> so I think we're just getting your presentation lined up. And again, if you have questions for Ray during his presentation, if you just want to pop them into the, um, the questions tab on the sidebar, um, I'll relay them to Ray at the very end. So Ray, I think your presentation should be up and um, I'll hand control over to you. And uh, for next slide, just just give us a give us a cue and we'll, we'll move it along. Okay. Thanks, no Ray. Problem. Um, listen, thanks very much, guys, uh, for the opportunity to, to uh, uh, present this morning. Um, it's good to see uh, such interest in the cluster from its form, formation only only a, a short few years ago. So it's it's great to be involved from the inception the whole way through. So um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Ray Alcorn. I'm the CEO uh, of Exceedance. Um, and this morning, I'm going to tell you uh, how we're geared up to support the development of offshore wind projects. Uh, not only in Ireland, but elsewhere uh, with our financial digital twin software. Um, so we're going to show you some examples of what we've done and who we work with. Um, we also have, I don't know if we can we can see him, we have Dr. Brendan Cahill from Exceedance this morning with us as well, and he'll be happy to follow up with you uh, in any kind of queries. We're also one of those uh, seven companies joining the Global Offshore Wind uh, next week uh, with Dara. So we'll be available there as well. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, good. Um, so uh, who are we? Um, we set up in 2015 to sell um, techno financial uh, digital twin software and the supporting consultancy that goes along with it uh, needed to the renewable energy sector. Uh, any of you guys that, that know us out there, um, we actually started in Marine Renewables, which is uh, Wave and Tidal. Actually, we know James from uh, from our previous life. Um, but we moved more into uh, offshore wind. We've been doing a lot in uh, floating wind and combined platforms and com combined sites as well, which is quite interesting. Um, so we help with um, technical financial modeling right from the concept uh, of uh, projects being born um, and technologies uh, right through to operation side of things. Uh, we are uh, an EI HPSU company, so I have to shout out to EI for, for supporting us along, uh, along the years. Uh, our main offices are in Cork, although we haven't been in them since uh, since March, so everybody's been working remotely, kind of like James's uh, office. And we have a UK office uh, in in Belfast, which uh, allows us to take part in in UK projects and and have the the local content there as well. Um, our software is now mainly cloud based, and we have a broad off offering both in uh, functionality and uh, subscription wise. So effectively, there's something for everybody. Um, and we're also developing our integrations with other systems. So next slide, please. So just about who we are, this is our senior team. This is not a complete picture of software team and, and uh, sales and admin or whatever, but our senior team, we've got years of experience in, in, in the sector um, across software development. So we develop software, um, energy, 
and uh, finance, and we've got our you know diverse backgrounds from utilities, uh, banks, energy agencies, and uh, project developers. So the reason I put that up there is just to say that we understand you, we 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 speak your language, and uh, we know how to work with you, uh, and we know how to help you. Um, next slide, please. So how do we help when uh, when you come along? Oh, that slide skipped forward to. Never mind. I'll 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 talk to it. But um, so if you at the start of the journey, um, oh no, love, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, uh, if you're at the start of the journey, um, developing an offshore wind project, um, you got to know the you want to know the basics. Uh, you want to know how much money is it going to make and when is it going to when it when it's going to make that money, and your challenge to create those financial models is to assimilate a lot of technical and financial data from a great many sources, including the kind of survey information that James was talking about and other net ocean data and things like that. Um, if you're already operating and you're, you're um, active, um, you're, and all the capex is already sunk, um, and perhaps it isn't going to plan, then what can be done? Um, and again, to be able to answer those kind of questions and make any, any interventions, your challenge is to sift through a lot of technical and financial data, trying to get some insights. Um, next slide. But really, the problem that we have found uh, in this case is not with the sifting through the data, but in how techno-financial modeling has, has been done to date. Um, your industry, it's worth, you know, it's worth billions of euros. It's built in this area around manual tools and uh, spreadsheets. There's no real standard platforms um, existing to generate the financial plans, uh, to stress test any kind of investments or to share this across the team easily uh, without the burden of any audit or, or control. And while that's difficult now, and it's a bit of a pain point now, um, it's gonna become a major roadblock. Um, the volume of projects you see is, is increasing. Um, the the need to deliver uh, grows. The, the costs are, are being driven down. Margins are becoming slimmer, um, and the subsidies are being phased out. So now it's the time to maybe think a little bit differently. What we typically see, and hopefully this resonates with you, um, that we see we see teams do this kind of stuff. That they're, they're split, with uh, some of them working on the technical side, doing uh, resource and yield calculations. Uh, you know, taking resource data maybe using some engineering tools and then handing over those static uh, values to a modeling team who then uh, build a financial model in Excel or spreadsheet software. Um, and what we have found is typically that method means that teams spend around 80% of their time um, working on model building and about 20% of their time actually using them uh, and doing the deep analysis and, and optimization, which we think is a little bit crazy. It's, it's, uh, it's like only getting value out of your team one day a week. So uh, yeah, anyway, we think there's another way. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, th there is another way. So um, over a number of years, we've developed um, exceedance finance software. Um, it is a standardized process focused on analytics. It's nice and transparent, it's shareable, and it's there to identify and reduce risk. Um, it's, as I say, it is a cloud-based uh, financial digital twin. And what we do is we've been empowering the teams within companies uh, to drastically reduce their model build time, um, getting to the analysis phase a lot quicker, and then connecting your internal teams and often your external partners into that, that process. Um, we also help you avoid the opportunity cost of having your experts. So typically, the people that are involved in this are very well qualified and very smart, and you don't want them spending their time trying to understand why Excel isn't working. Um, you want you don't want them to spend the time building models, and then we allow them instead to focus on optimizing those projects, uh, allowing you to make better decisions and make better returns. So effectively, we take that 80-20 ratio I told you about earlier and flip it on its head. So next slide, let's just look at the platform a little bit more detail. Um, so we have, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, next next slide again. Um, so looking a bit more detail, 
so we've prioritized the steps required to create uh, and optimize financial models. Um, and anybody who's in this area, hopefully these steps make sense to you or you, they resonate with you. Um, and what we've done is we've put it onto a customizable uh, Microsoft Azure platform. And the, the choice of Microsoft Azure, it gives us guaranteed uptime um, with uh, very strong data uh, security and user security and, and, and a blend of those securities. Um, we allow the teams to go from resource turbine selection through to building project costs and revenues and generate financial KPIs um, and cash flows. There are literally hundreds of variables that go into making these models. But what we have done is we have streamlined the workflow, only asking you when you need them to allow a range of data resolutions to be included. You know, you might not have all the data all at, the, at your fingertips, so we allow a range to be used. Typically, you start with wind data. So again, we're going to talk about surveys and information. You might start with wind data, and that can come, come from a variety of sources. Maybe it's measured, maybe it's modeled, and uh, maybe you've done a maybe you've done a, a data campaign. Then you go along to select the turbine types you might use. You might have a deal already done, or you might be looking at maybe Vestas or maybe Siemens, or maybe you want to look at future turbines, like 12 or 15 megawatt future examples. We have some of those built already. Then you go on to a yield calculator, calculate your yield, take into losses, availability, all of those sort of parameters. Uh, once you've got your yield, you go into the financial modeling side of things, put in CapEx and OpEx, and as much or as little detail as you have. Um, go through the financial model options uh, with debt, equity, tax, depreciation, discount rate, all of those kind of uh, lovely things that the financial modelers keep to themselves normally. Uh, and then we spit out about 11 um, financial KPIs, all the cash flow sheets, all the graphs, all the graphics, um, and a range of uh, reports. That's not really the power of doing this. That's just building it like you, like you would normally do, albeit in a very reduced time frame. But the real power now, now lies in the ability to analyze and optimize your projects. So you can compare projects like for like, you can do um, you can do currency, you know, look at different currencies if you want. You can adjust any of the variables, so hundreds of variables. You can try multiple scenarios. You can even do goal seek on parameters. So for example, you could uh, search the parameter space to try and optimize for gross margin. And we'll talk about some of those examples now as we get into the offshore wind side of things. So yep, next slide. So here's a typical life cycle. Uh, again, um, I think James talked about this, which is quite interesting. And we see how we fit across all of these different phases. Um, so we can help make decisions um, across the life cycle uh, from your initial feasibility studies to detailed financial analysis for securing investment to managing the project during operation um, to help make it as profitable as possible. Uh, so we can help you find value year upon year upon year. But um, in Dara's email at the very beginning of this to us, he said he's very clear he wanted to see some very clear examples of offshore wind. So we have a few case studies to talk about. So maybe if we click onto the next slide, we can start uh, talking about that. So how, how do we add value? So our first area is actually in the area of technology innovation. And I think Dara and Liam mentioned some of the, the, the partners within the cluster who are looking at uh, you know um, load reduction and mooring technology and things like that. So um, we we have been uh, working with a number of uh, technology developers um, through this program called the Marine Energy Alliance. Uh, it's been running for nearly three years now, and we've worked with about uh, 15 companies. Um, and we've been looking at things like new turbines, components, processes, and balance of plant. But you know, mostly we've been working with the developers, helping them to understand how they influence the, the cost of energy and how they could improve things by bringing every innovation back to its co cost impact um, and the bottom line and the impact it may have on a, on, a, on a project or the impact it might have on the technology itself. Although you know the partners we've listed there, they're, they're mostly wave and tidal. We've also been working with a number of floating wind, uh, uh, floating solar, um, and we've been working on projects as well as these, say, mooring component suppliers. Um, so, for example, with the mooring components, we're able to show, a, you know, a more expensive mooring um, with the lifetime costs uh, reducing over over the life of the project. So, next slide, please. Here's some work we did with a floating wind developer. Uh, we looked at the cost reduction pathways, uh, combining a series of drivers of the levelized cost of energy. 
we're able to map out the key innovations across a number of technical and financial. And you can see, uh, well, maybe the text is a little bit small, um, but you can see we looked at eight different uh, sectors, uh, looking at you know capex, structural costs, mooring costs, things like that. And in this case, we're able to give them a roadmap of 45% cost reduction over their, their program. Next slide. We're nearly finished there, Dara. We're nearly there. Uh, another thing we did in offshore wind side of things, uh, when you're at the development phase and you're building, we've been building a bid auction module to allow rapid scenario building. And this is typical in the early stages of bid preparation. So for example, comparing various turbine manufacturers or looking at different sites or looking at maybe future turbine examples. Again, imagine at the preparation of bids phase, you have various costs, right? from along the supply chain elements you got performance data and you got a range of turbo manufacturers to deal with uh, and you might have pressure to create the winning bid so we want to help streamline streamline that process and uh, the idea is to allow for optimization of the project around a bid price while still maintaining a sufficient margin next slide no oh, okay good uh, here we did some work with uh, Ori Catapult and, and, and Data Pitch. So what we did is we um, we took a lot of historical operational wind uh, data and performance data. And what we did is we brought in about two years worth of operational SCADA and financial data. And we were able to identify under performance of a small wind farm, um, both from the asset uh, under performance and for from financial changes that happened. And what we did is we looked at the delta uh, between what was actually happening and what uh, was originally modelled at financial close. We then took this project, they actually said, well, so what? Um, so then what we did is we projected this out um, and showed what would happen over the lifetime if we continued uh, without any interve intervention. And then finally, we used our own scenario engine to try a number of different scenarios to see if we could get the project back to functioning uh, financially correctly. We looked at things like uh, repowering, lifetime extension, extension, increased on m spend and things like that to show that we could correct these, these these problems. In a small farm, we're able to identify potential 40 million euro loss and, and help come, come up with uh, correction scenarios. Okay, uh, next slide. And I think this is our second last slide. As I mentioned, we've got some other case studies. They're on our website. Um, I welcome you to go on there and have a look at them. They give a lot more deep detail than I've had time to go into. Um, so, for example, we've done a calibration of a financial engine against one of the big fours. We've also worked with uh, multinational wood combining engineering software uh, with financial software to show that you can uh, get enhanced uh, projects very quickly uh, and optimize from the design side of things. Okay, next slide. Okay, just to wrap up, so we are ready uh, to help you with projects and we can offer a blend of software and consultancy. Uh, we're actually willing to develop some pilot projects with the right companies, of course. And since we're always developing, um, we're interested in partnering through integrations and other packages and, and data sources. So, you know, uh, get in touch with either Brendan or myself and we're happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Ray. That's great. Um, I'll just ask Liam. I think Liam's been monitoring the questions coming through, so uh, Liam's just going to relay those to you. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Dara. Uh, Ray, so there's a question in there um, around, uh, have you been involved in specific discussions with lenders during the due diligence process on a project, and how accepting were they of your technology over the traditional kind of financial modeling review by a technical advisor, that kind of approach? Uh, we haven't been involved with uh, any lenders. We have been involved with funders, which would be government funders, and we have been involved with investors. And uh, so funders and investors have been um, accepting of it. So for example, SEAI in, in Ireland actually um, have a license of our, our software to look at wave energy projects. So okay, they're, great. They're accepting, but but not not lenders yet. Okay, great. Um, I, I was really interested there in in your approach on uh, looking at existing projects because I would always have associated your software with um, you know planning projects and looking at the financials there. That's a really interesting example there of, of looking at a retro um, 
view? Yeah, well, we wanted to see how we could maybe bring value across the, you know, the, the lifetime of a project, kind of like what James mentioned earlier as well, you know, that these projects run for like 25 years. So how can we bring value? You've already got the financial model built. Um, so what we were doing there is just loading in um, the actual performance data and comparing it back to what happened in financial close. And you you can identify underperformance. Like there's lots of other pieces of software out there that, that uh, do that from a technical perspective. We're the only people that, that bring it right down to the financials and then project that out to the future and then give you options to correct that. Very good. Okay, listen, uh, there's, um, I think we, we've got to move to the next presenter. So, Ray, thank you very much. And um, Dara, I'm going to hand back to you now at this stage. Okay. Great stuff. Thank you, Ray. And again, Thanks, as I said before, I think we have some more questions coming through and we will follow, follow up with you directly, Ray, if that's okay. So, um, Paul, um, can you hear us or can we hear you? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll just take a moment just to go back to the start of your presentation and then we'll um, hand the floor over to you. I think it will be uh, audio only probably today, but <laughs> okay. Okay. You want to move on to the next slide? Thanks, Paul. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so apologies for the the sound difficulties earlier on. Uh, just to give you a bit of background into into GDG, uh, Gavin and Ahardy Geo Solutions. We are an engineering consultancy specializing in, in, in offshore wind. Um, we also have a team of, 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 of onshore engineers that get involved in then things like landfall assessment, cable assessment, and so on. Uh, we set up the company back in 2011, myself and my colleague, um, and we've since grown it to, I think this slide says 80 people, but I think we're up to about 92 now. Um, I think we'll be at uh, about 100 people by the end of the year. Um, so good, strong growth through um, through this year, despite the COVID challenges. Um, next slide. Okay, so uh, in terms of where we're located, we initially set up a, a, an office in Dublin to, I suppose, back in 2011. Um, we, we anticipated that the Irish offshore wind market was going to start to gain quite a lot of traction. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, and it, it, I, I suppose we're seeing that kind of momentum starting now, maybe a decade later. Uh, which is good to see, but in the, in the intervening period, obviously we had to we had to do something with our time. So we we looked at projects kind of further afield. Um, we're now up to six offices spread between Ireland and the UK. So we have an office in Dublin, Cork, and Belfast, uh, and we have an office in Edinburgh, Bath, and London. Um, I think over the last decade we've worked on about 35 gigawatts of offshore wind projects worldwide, um, and there's new pro projects kind of coming into the portfolio every day. Um, our kind of core skill set and where we started from was really in the geotechnical area where we were looking at kind of ground conditions and, and management of the, the ground risk on projects. So that goes for kind of survey management and the associated uh, geotechnical interpretation, foundation design, uh, and then management of the interfaces around that. I, I think since we set up originally, we've expanded into, into a wider kind of owner, owner's engineering role, and I'll touch on some case studies now in a minute. Maybe next slide. Um, we've worked for quite a wide range of clients. So I think um, uh, looking at the attendee list, I think a few of these are, are, are maybe on the on the line today. So uh, and from a developer point of view, we've worked with uh, SSC, Vattenfall, EDF, Vibadrola, ESB. Um, from a contractor perspective, we've worked with people like Yandon Olsi, we have lifting. Um, and I think we've also worked with all of the, the OEMs as well, um, done quite a lot of work with General Electric, um, as well as Siemens and, and, and various other suppliers. I'd say because of how we fit into the supply chain, um, we have also worked with, uh, with other consultants and, and, and often partner with other consultants to deliver specific scopes of work. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of reference project locations, um, we have done a lot of work in the Irish Sea, a lot of work around the UK coast, um, uh, as well as work in, off the coast of France, uh, Baltic Sea, uh, Dutch and German sectors of the North Sea. Um, and I suppose over the last kind of two to three years, 
developed quite a significant portfolio of projects in um, in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. So uh, looking at uh, portfolio projects in Taiwan, Vietnam, uh, some early stage development in South Korea and Philippines and Japan. Um, and I would say Asia is probably our fastest growing as well as our largest uh, our largest market at the moment. Next slide. In terms of the, the team that we have around us, uh, it, it's a real mixed bag of kind of very niche specialist expertise combined with kind of some strong project management uh, and support functions as well. So we have engineering geology, geotechnical engineers, geophysical engineers and ground modeling specialists, structural engineers looking at foundation design, marine engineering, uh, marine civil design, soil structure interaction, um, and then kind of support staff with GIS, CAD support and so on. Next slide. Uh, and again, uh, in terms of our expertise, we have um, uh, kind of a, a wide range of kind of service offerings. We have due diligence, survey management, offshore uh, reps. We have quite a significant number of our staff in-house are offshore qualified um, and uh, of, often go and spend significant portions of time looking at either the construction phase or the survey phases of projects, do a lot of work in desk studies, geohazard assessment and concept design. Might move on. Next slide. Um, one of the areas where I suppose we find uh, quite a lot of work, it's often a very quick turnaround, is, is in due diligence. And this could be for kind of the lender side, um, it, it could be uh, due diligence focused on the finance, or, or it could be technical due diligence um, linked into a merger or an acquisition. Um, and yeah, depending on the role that we take on, it could be to do with a specific risk area that we're asked to look at, or it could be a wider um, uh, comfort blanket that we're being asked to assess uh, for, for the project as a whole um, in advance of, of, of an acquisition. Next stage. Um, survey management and client representation. Uh, so this this is kind of one of the uh, one of the biggest areas of the business, which is which is helping developers from the outset of a project, uh, looking at their site investigation scoping, their survey strategy definition, developing specifications and scoping documents, um, and then helping through the procurement process, the tendering, tender evaluation, and ultimately managing that that both contract management and technical management as, as the project is delivered. Next slide. Um, then we also have uh, de desk studies. I mean, this is kind of bread and butter stuff. Um, we, we do get involved in kind of your standard geotechnical desktop studies and, and, and so on. We also get involved in kind of some of the more unique um, desktop studies, trying to maximize the available information. So particularly at the outset of a project where DevX uh, is tight and, and you know there isn't, a, there isn't a huge budget to spend on, on, on projects, how can you get best information with, with uh, how can you get Use the information that's available to you to best effect. Uh, and, and if you look at some of the images on the on the left hand side of this slide, you can see um, particular scour imagery ar around existing shipwrecks. Uh, and this is kind of a, a study, that, a scour desktop study that we did to to quantify the extent of scour around certain shipwrecks, um, and use that then to determine uh, purely desk desk based. You use the existing information to determine. Um, what extent of scar we would have on the turbines in the long term. Um, so using the shipwrecks as a proxy uh, for, for the kind of scar that you might get um, on, on turbines. And we were able to map the, the current directions and, and, and track this back to the, to the hydrodynamic regime as well. Next slide. Ground model development, yeah. So this is, this is kind of one of our core skill sets, basically taking existing geophysical information or new geophysical information, combining it with geotechni geotechnical data sets, and ultimately creating like a 3D uh, visualization of the subsurface. And this is all about managing risk, um, how, how, how risk can be managed through the development process. And um, we've a dedicated in-house team that includes geophysicists, geotechnical engineers, and GIS anal analysts that all work together to develop these 3D ground models. Um, we've also just secured a research project to look at online visualization of this and how we can share interactive models with developers that they can then query in real time through a web platform. Um, and that should be completed kind of middle of next year. Um, and that'll kind of revolutionize how we how we share these and interact with the ground models. So the ground model function is there at the moment, but 
really about the client interact uh, in, in interactions and, and user friendliness of these models is what we're working on at the moment. Next slide. Um, geotechnical interpretation. This is looking at the, the the existing kind of soil properties and, and rock properties on the meter site and coming up with um, uh, an interpretive report that captures that data set and, and is used then by the designers in the process going forward. Next slide. Um, foundation concept design. So this is something that we've done for, you know, of the 32 gigawatts of projects, I think we've done foundation concept design for quite a significant number of those projects. And this, this, this ranges from kind of option assessment, screening in or screening out foundations um, to, to looking at kind of first pass geometries and dimensioning and cost benefit analysis for different foundation types. Um, we also do a lot of work on foundation risk management. So it's not just about what is the best foundation from a technical point of view when it's installed and when it's, when it's in the ground, but also what is the risk profile of getting that foundation installed using conventional vessels, conventional lifting equipment, and so on. Next slide. Then I so stepping through the process, the next step from concept design is once we have a concept locked in, whether it's a monopile or a jacket, we would then uh, progress, or a suction case on solution, we would then progress to detail design, which includes kind of the uh, working out the geometry, looking at the load iterations, uh, doing the the load assessments with the turbine supplier and, and updating the foundation design and going through a number of loops on that. Next slide. Um, once we've kind of locked in a, a foundation um, design, then, then I mean a key aspect of it is the installation assessment. So we do vibratory driving analysis, impact driving analysis, transport and installation studies, fatigue design, uh, and jack up assessments and spud count assessments for, for vessels as well. Next slide. Um, very focused on the foundation so, so, so far, but I mean, another key area that we get involved with is cable uh, cable design and cable route assessments. Uh, and this ranges from kind of early stage desktop studies to looking at kind of uh, specific geohazards and, and coming up with a preferred cable route and then taking that through the engineering development, cable burial risk assessment and so on. Next slide. Um, cable burial risk assessment, I mean, this is kind of a, a, core, a core task for us, which is coming up with the preferred uh, or the required cable burial um, Set uh, to minimise the risk from, uh, I suppose, cable issues long term. And I know from the insurance side of things, um, cable, cable damage has been a huge uh, bone of contention with the insurance industry. Um, and accurate cable burial risk assessment, I think, is one of those kind of key technical tasks and studies that needs to be done early doors to ensure that the uh, the risk of cable damage is, ma is, is, is managed through the process. Next slide. Yeah, depending then on who, who we're dealing with as a client, whether it's a developer or a contractor, um, we also get involved in kind of the tool assessment and determining whether you're going to jet or plow or, 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 or you're into a cutting situation for your cable installation. Um, and this could, could be done for a developer or could be done for a, a EPCI contractor, depending on the, uh, the contract strategy for that project. Next slide. Um, I suppose just just to just to say we don't always get involved in the development phase. It could also be in the construction phase where we we look at kind of existing scar protection systems or existing foundations or existing cables and try and determine um, you know the residual lifetime, the uh, whether they actually meet the original design standards in some case, whether they're they're meeting conditions of lease requirements um, and so on. Next slide. Okay, so just a couple of quick case studies then to to just to highlight those experience. So um, you, you can keep going to the next slide. Um, yeah, we have kind of reference projects worldwide. One of those projects, High Long, is, is, is probably one of the big, busiest projects for us. The first phase, 300 megawatts. The overall project is about one and a half gigawatts. Um, and since actually pulling together this slide, the, tur the turbine has been updated. We're now looking at the 14 megawatt Siemens machine. Um, and we're providing the owner's engineering services. So we started off providing geotechnical expertise and, and survey management, and that's been ex extended into kind of design, uh, design, design support, design management, um, certification management, and general owner's engineering. Next slide. Um, yeah, the Arclo 
offshore wind project. We're, we're involved there. It's a project of 520 megawatts and the Irish Sea, the client's SSE. Um, and we've helped with a couple of things um, in the public domain. Uh, there, was a, there was a press article around the announcement, recent announcement of their O&M base, um, where GDG helped select the O&M base. Um, and then we've also got involved in uh, survey management and, and geotechnical support as well. Next slide. Um, Rampy and Offshore Wind Project. This was one of the first projects we got involved with back in 2013 or 2014, um, where we started off doing geotechnical interpretation, ended up doing everything from ground model development, uh, survey manage, some survey management, some monopile design, installation assessment, certification support. Quite a turned out to be quite a chunky project um, and quite a significant number of turbines to analyze at the time. Next slide. Um, Fester have offshore project. This is in the uh, off the Danish coast. It's actually gone back through another round of EIA now. But we previously looked at geotechnical interpretation and took the geotechnical interpretive report through the certification process with DNV. Next slide. Uh, Baltic offshore wind farm, probably one of our biggest projects at the moment, where we're supporting PGE, the Polish utility. Um, and that's kind of taking everything from kind of desk study assessment through survey management, geotechnical interpretation, cabling support. It, it, it's effectively it's an owner's engineering type role where we're walking through the process of um, ground model development and, and, and risk management and early stage concept engineering foundation design. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a project where we're not able to mention the name. It's in the North Sea, and it was a gravity-based um, uh, concept um, where we did 3D FE modeling. We have a lot of skills in house in numerical modeling and, and, and 3D analysis, so um, that's something that kind of features in a lot of our projects. Next slide. Uh, I think this is one of the last ones now. So this, this is just an interesting, not a, not a wind turbine, but a met mast on a novel foundation where we looked at kind of the installation assessment for this twisted jacket structure. Uh, we also did some some monitoring of the structure and recently published some of those uh, the findings. Um, so if anyone's interested in the structural behavior of this unique twisted jacket, um, feel free to get in touch and I can share that that paper. Next slide. Yeah, so this is one of the unusual ones. So this is, this is looking at how close Jacob vessels can get to key walls in northern France. Uh, a client was EDF, and they were assessing the kind of construction ports uh, for some of their projects in off French waters and wanted to know which, which vessels were suitable and if they got went for certain vessels, how close they could get to the key wall. So a lot of treaty numer numerical analysis to help with that decision making. Next slide. Um, this is the Vietnamese project where we looked at kind of a number of different foundation concepts. And again, you can see the numerical modeling is a kind of key feature of, of our kind of foundation design. Next slide. And that's it. So a bit of a whistle stop tour through some, some case studies and, and kind of an overview of, of, of what we, we do. Uh, happy to take any questions. Great, thanks Paul. Paul. Go ahead, Liam. I think you've been collating questions there. Oh, yeah. Um, hi, Paul. Uh, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, really interesting presentation there. Um, if anybody has questions, guys, please get them into the questions facility there and, and we can pass them on to Paul. But a couple for you, Paul, that just occurred to me there as you were talking. Um, the, the new kind of bigger and bigger machines, and we're now heading for 14 megawatts. Um, do they pose particular challenges in terms of geophysics or, you know, is it simply just allowing for that larger size or, you know, what are the, the challenges around putting that kind of machine or, or driving a pile for that kind of machine into the seabed? Yes, fair point, Liam. Um, we, we've just, we just, just actually finished looking at a, a monopile design. Um, where we're looking at a 14 megawatt machine um, and potentially a 15 megawatt machine um, in water depths up to kind of 40, 42 meters. Um, and if we if we go back even two or three years ago, uh, people would have said that was unfeasible and, and technically not viable. Um, and yes, here we are today doing detailed design and it's uh, 
not, not only is it is it viable, it, it, it's gone past kind of any of the boundaries where where anyone kind of thought uh, thought it would have gone to. So so I think we're, we're we're constantly pushing. There are kind of fabrication limits that we're now starting to hit around the ten meter diameter in terms of the rolling steel and transporting steel. Um, right. But uh, but there are like all of those challenges seem to be overcome as well. So uh, I think as long as um, as long as people are open to, to kind of pushing the boundaries, we'll, we'll keep finding kind of new solutions and, and, and keep using kind of monopiles and deeper waters, um, yeah, with bigger turbines. Yeah, that's an interesting one around, um, I suppose, jackets. And, and somebody made this comment to me that, that when floating becomes a conventional technology for deeper water, effectively all you're going to see is monopiles or floating technology jackets effectively will become redundant. What's your what's your view on that? Do you see that as, as happening? I think we're quite a way off from that. Yes. Um, I mean, if you look at kind of sixty to seventy meters of water, um, or in certain ground conditions uh, like the very soft material that we find in Taiwan, for example, um, jackets have a place, um, yeah. and jackets on suction caissons have have a place as well for certain ground conditions. Uh, and I think. It, it, we did a cost assessment actually quite recently comparing a jack a jacket foundation in, in 70 meters compared to a, a floating technology and there was still quite a significant gap um so like, like if you were developing a project today uh, i think there is room in the market for jackets um uh, but in 10 years time that might change it all depends on how quickly the the, the cost comes down for floating yeah, and, and there's an interesting question now, and I ask everybody that come across in the industry this question, and I know you, you've answered it for me as well, but just for the audience, what's your view on commercialization of floating time frame? What do you think? Uh, I think I think 2030 is, is, is realistic. I, I, like if I, if I look at how it's progressed in the last couple of years, it, it's it's way exceeded my expectations and I think the general expectations of the industry. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I'm saying 2030 as my best estimate, but I, I, I also wouldn't be surprised if, um, if that was beaten. Uh, I think the, some of the floating technologies are, are, are coming along in leaps and bounds. And um, yeah, it could be pre-2030, but 2030 would be my best guess. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Listen, that's great, Paul. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're coming up on 12.13, which is kind of where um, the that time slot exists. Um, thanks very much. If anybody has additional questions for Paul, get in contact with Dara and myself. We'd be more than happy to fill you in. Dara, I'm going to hand back to you at this stage. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Um, OK, we'll, we'll move on now to our, um, our final presentation of the day. Um, which is going to be coming to us from Adrian Mulholland, who is Director and CFO with Villacom. Um, Adrian, you can, there you go. <laughs> you are, uh, Hi, Adrian. I'll, uh, I'll leave it to you to, to take from here. Thanks, Adrian. Great, thanks, Dara. Thanks, Liam. And good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll try and be very, very quick. I'm, I'm looking at attendees there, so I'll just try and hold that 60 or 70 for about 10 minutes, please. Um, my name's Adrian Mulholland. I'm director and a board member for Villacom, one of Ireland's leading providers of wireless 4G, 5G connectivity. Um, next slide, please. Villacom has been delivering high performance connectivity solutions both in Ireland and the UK for over 20 years. And now just recently, some really impressive slides there from, from our colleagues now, multiple multiple sites, multiple opportunities. We've actually just been in the offshore space for 12 to 18 months, but even during that time, it's been a really, really exciting journey for us. I'm going to take you through both the why and how we deliver 4G, 5G solutions for offshore wind farms. And following this, to listen to some of your views, observations, comments, and questions, if you have any. I also hope it allows you to gain an understanding of what we do. I've attached at the end of the slides my contact details should you wish to touch base with me afterwards. Um, next slide, please. So, Villacom is a leading wireless connectivity specialist. We provide 4 and 5G networks which deliver fast, secure, and scalable end to end connectivity now for offshore wind farms. 
Next slide, please. Our solution is an all-encompassing service. We combine pre-project advisory scoping and vendor selection to the design and install of robust wireless systems for our customers. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk you through a little bit about 4, 4G and 5G mobile networks for offshore wind farms. Next slide, please. So this is really all the options that exist for, for offshore connectivity. And we're actually up in the, in the further right-hand quadrant there under cellular. Offshore communications, it's nothing new. It's been around for decades through radio frequency, satellite, walkie-talkies, and other options. What is new, however, is offshore ultra-reliable and low-latency network connectivity. Real connectivity as opposed to just general communications that makes a difference. There's now a much greater understanding within the market and its users about the importance of super-fast offshore internet networks and what they can bring to many users. From our perspective, delivering 4G, 5G offshore connectivity means that all mobile stroke network technology devices have coverage that is fast, safe, and reliable, that allows people and devices to do so many other things. Next slide, please. So to Villacom, there's three critical whys for mobile connectivity, and I'd like to just quickly talk you through them. The first why is construction, making them lean and optimized. We basically, 4G and 5G solutions digitalize the construction process of wind farms. Generally, a, a wind farm construction takes between three and five years. The operators leverage the most advanced machinery to deliver on time and on budget. Having a 4 and 5G mobile network delivers this connectivity for some or all of these requirements. The construction platforms and turbines requires multiple ships, large numbers of workers at sea for a prolonged period of time. Having an ultra fast and reliable internet connectivity is a platform for achieving optimal results at lowest possible cost. Next slide, please. So the second of three whys for mobile connectivity is staff. With hundreds of people offshore on these sites at any one time, effectively, it's both their office and their home at sea. So workers rely on systems to do their work, like SAP, CAD, etc. Then home at sea after hours, they require communication for leisure or to stay in touch with their family. Phone and email communications can include Teams, Skype, et cetera, for businesses. And of course, a happy worker is a productive worker, and connectivity is the essential utility in this process. And finally, staff safety at all times. Next slide, please. The third and final why is future proof and communications for all operations. And this goes across multiple reasons. Um, from one such reason, it's effectively the investment at sea. Communications account for less than 1% of the total capital outlay cost, but yet it can do so many other things that enable new technologies, robotic drones, um, asset tracking, and this lasts and can be upgraded for periods of 10, 20, maybe up to 30 years. The continuous automation and optimization of manufacturing and the facilities, having 4G, 5G systems there supports that. It also allows the maintenance of turbines and platforms, uh, either with devices or, 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 with, or with actual people, and then condition-based monitoring at all times. So there, there's the three whys. Next slide, please. So delivering the 4G, 5G mobile network at sea. So this would be a traditional or old, as we call it now, amongst the, the, the comms network. The initial construction phase, effectively, not to get into this slide in too much detail, but it uses VSAT, so satellite, for communication purposes. This is quite basic, it's expensive, it's not overly reliable, and it's significant latency. 
It's necessary, however, in the early construction phases for vessels where there's no offshore fiber or power. Next slide, please. Now moving to network or internet connectivity, the four to 5G systems. So this is where a fiber connection is developed. And from this, you can develop a radio wireless 4G, 5G network uh, out from this. So you have your station um, at base on land, the fiber goes out to sea, out to the substations and, and the power grids. And then from that, you do point to point antennas throughout the space uh, and site of, of the offshore wind farm. Next slide, please. So just putting this into practice, over the last 12 months, Villacom have been really lucky and excited to have been, um, we, we won an offshore project with, uh, one of the offshore projects that we won, with, it's been with Erstad and Hornsey too. Um, next slide, please. So Hornsey too, just a little bit about it. It's the world's largest offshore wind farm site. It's 55 miles offshore. We designed, and they will use a public wireless network at sea. And we offered this network using a Vodafone public network as it was the most cost effective and would provide seamless connectivity for Erstad, the operations and for Vodafone users. Next slide, please. So just a little bit on the, the technical side. So, um, Ersted has an offshore base there in Killingholme, which is in Grimsby on the east coast of the UK and uh, not far from Norwich. So from that, it's run a fiber link cable out to one of its existing sites, which is Hornsey One, which is approximately 20 to 30 miles offshore. And just to put this into perspective, mobile connectivity may or may not work for about two to three miles offshore. After that, you have to use fiber. Next slide, please. So from that Hornsey one, which is on that slide, you can see the RCS. So that's effectively the reactive compensation station, or in simple terms, it's the power station that also connects a further fiber cable, another 20 to 30 kilometers out to sea on the Hornsey two station. And then the next slide, please. On that station, so again, just to illustrate, with the onshore at Killing Home, going out 20, 30 kilometers to the RCS, Hornsey One, that fiber, that's then connecting the fiber cable to multiple uh, offshore substations, the OSSs. And at the moment, we've they've designed three of these, and within um, a radius of 465 square kilometers. So within that space, you have full high performance connectivity at all times. And that's due to go live or for testing um, mid 2021 and hopefully live by the end of 2021. Next slide, please. And this is the final slide, just in terms of the antennas and just the scale of what we do. This is what Villacom has been doing on land for, for those 20 years, but out at sea, you build a large antenna. In this case, it's 55 meters uh, above sea level. And so long that then we build multiple and smaller antennas um, on floating and fixed vessels, uh, and they need to be approximately 20 meters above. And one of the reasons for that is because of the movement, but also sometimes the waves that it has to stay above that at all times. So that's just a little bit about that project. And it goes, it's the same for, for other projects that we're currently tendering. Um, as I said, once you go beyond two to three miles offshore and you have a fiber connection to these sites, uh, high performance for 4G and 5G solutions and wireless connectivity solutions will work. Uh, next slide, please. So just the questions, I'll just ask and repeat my own questions before I take yours. Uh, three takeaways here is the why. So the first why it is, it can be done. Wireless connectivity can be provided as far out uh, as one 
project we're looking to tender for at the moment, which is 175 kilometers off the coast of the UK um, shores. And what, so long as you have fiber going to that site, this will work. Uh, the other why is it, who uses it? You, multiple users from construction to staff to your long-term investments. The how, as I said, it works once you have your fiber links built. And then what now? Villacom, while we're serving uh, Ersted as a tier one provider, and it's great, it, we also provide for the tier twos, the construction companies who may need it, very quick upload speeds, comms, networks, and also tier three, and it was interesting, some of the presentations there as well, when you've the likes of moving vessels and drones, all these robotics, and that's what's happening, and that will be the future. And so long as you have these systems offshore, um, those robotics and those IT systems will work. That's it for me, and over to yourselves if you've any questions, and thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Adrian, that's great. Um, your last point actually brings me on to the first question, and um, it's about the, the key role of, of wireless communications um, as a key technology enabler, I guess, for um, for the operation of offshore wind, particularly looking further afield as wind farms get, get further from the shore. Um, do you see Villacom's technology and, and solutions as being a key technology enabler? Um, is it something that's going to be required to work with interventional solutions? Obviously, that's the direction of, of um, travel in the industry is, is that move towards, as you mentioned, drones or um, autonomous vehicles, survey vessels. Um, how important is the communications technology to facilitate um, interventions and monitoring solutions like that? It's very important, Dara, and to be fair, well, maybe I'm slightly biased. We think it will be critical, both now and in the future. It's interesting there, uh, James mentioned um, for his company, the project up in Norway and people working remotely. What's happening on these sites, Dara, and what will happen on these sites as they develop, like costs will, are and will become a big picture. And one of the largest costs is people actually out on those sites. Having robotics uh, can help reduce those costs significantly. Um, we looked at one survey, we don't use it, but it's an example that when you have robotics on offshore sites at a minimum, you're going to save on your annual running costs up to 30, at, at rock bottom 30%. Maybe that's the accountant coming out of me. But if that's the rock bottom, maybe those cost savings will become more and more. And as offshore sites uh, are, are tendered, the, 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 the price per unit, the, the LCE is going down. They're constantly looking at efficiencies in that space. And for the less than 1% of those comms costs, you can develop multiple multiple percentages savings elsewhere by having those systems in place. Great. Um, and you mentioned you're you're currently tendering for a, a project that's 175 kilometers um, offshore, which is kind of fits in with, as I said, the future direction of travel in terms of floating offshore wind. So it's it's not a it's not a solution that's that's limited um, by distance. It seems as long as you have the fiber connectivity there you're, you're good to no. go essentially yeah and it's interesting as well it's kind of funny the development of some of these offshore sites some of the older ones the five or ten year ones tried to do it they were much closer offshore but now both in ireland and it'll be interesting now both in the uk and very very interesting in ireland um there's you know the, the way that's playing out you know people don't want to be able to see the 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 offshore farms close to shore, so you push them further out. You have to connect them through fiber, and once you fiber connectivity, Dara, then you can do whatever you like in terms of 4 or 5G, and then hanging off that and enabling everything else ro robotically from there. Um, you've, you've obviously got a very high profile um, client there in, in Northstead, and, and Hornsey too is a, a very high, high profile project in its own right. Um, how are things going? With that project, are you um, in the middle of delivery at the moment, or, or what's the time frame? And, and do you see it as something that's very rep replicable um, or easily replicated in, in other sites? 
So the work began in uh, October 2019. And we basically were about 60% complete by the end of this year, Dar. And I mentioned there earlier, I think in Q2 2021, it goes for testing. And the plan is to have it live by the end of 2021, uh, maybe early 2022. What's been really good about that project is the fiber was there already on Hornsey 1, and they were able to extend it quite quickly and seamlessly out to Hornsey 2. As I mentioned, there's some of the problems with some of these other sites, if there's no fiber, and sorry, I'll backpedal a bit, uh, some of the older sites that are close to shore, they're actually having com connectivity or communications problems because there's no fiber there in the first place. So it seems to be a given now that for all new sites that once that, that the fiber needs to be there. And as mm -hmm. I said, once the fiber's there, we can do anything from, from that point on. Do you think that's that's a challenge? Do you think the industry fully understands the benefits of, of fast 4G, 5G, um, offshore connectivity? Is it a is it a process? Is it a kind of educational process on your behalf as well, I guess? It is a process. It's a real process. And it's funny, again, us entering a new market. If we talk to comms people for the last 20 years within the comms industry, they understand the importance, that 99.9% .9 coverage on land. Trying to get that message offshore is a little bit different. While you're looking for the 99.9%, .9%, right, okay, so my phone or device works, but what else can you do? So the messaging is from it, it's actually, it needs to, come from them and in fairness to us that they're a very very advanced company they realize the benefits of using devices uh computer aided devices uh, their construction team safety and everything else and they know they know without those devices working that that reliability falls from is from 99 percent lower down and they're not willing to accept that which and as a result the likes of Villacom can benefit from that you need to get that message across, Dara, but you know, Villacom can only pedal that so far. But having pilot projects like like the Hornsey, it certainly allowed Villacom to leverage. Uh, recently, we presented actually on Sky News on that project, their CEO, Sean Keating. And and from that, that, that messaging just comes through and, uh, and and it's helped Villacom. But ultimately, we want to help what's on those sites as well. Yeah, excellent. As I said, it's a very high profile project and a very high profile customer. So, you know, um, I think watch the space. Hopefully, it'll be um, rep replicated in uh, plenty more sites to come. Um, Adrian, thanks very much. I think we're just Thank about out of time. Um, but, but thanks again for your presentation. And if um, I can see some questions coming through, if there are other questions coming through, well, I'll connect those people to, to, to directly. That would be great. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Enjoy your day. So, um, if we just move on to the final slide, um, that's it really, that we're, we're a couple of minutes over. Thanks for, for staying with us till the end. Um, and thanks again for joining today. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first of a series of Irish supply chain showcases that Enterprise Ireland will be, will be hosting. Um, the next one will be specifically focused on um, ports and harbours and key Irish um, capability um, in that space. So, you know, we'll keep you up to speed on, on that as details emerge. Um, if you have any questions about the Enterprise Ireland Offshore Wind Cluster, you can contact myself. Um, a couple of details are, are on screen there. Um, I'm based in London, as I mentioned at the start. Um, Liam Curran, my colleague, is based in Shannon on the west coast of Ireland. Um, Again, any questions, particularly on, on technology related questions, I think Liam is your man. Uh, and Jack, who I must say thanks to Jack for operating in the background and, and handling all the technical um, problems today. Um, Jack is in London as well with me working on this. So again, if there are any questions um, relating to the cluster or indeed any questions um, or queries about the four companies that presented today, please do get in touch. Um, as I mentioned, we are also exhibiting via a virtual uh, Ireland Country Pavilion at Global Offshore Wind next week. Uh, it's a three-day conference that runs from the 28th to the 30th. So if you are attending, um, please do get in touch. We've, we've seven companies that are going to be exhibiting with us there. So um, 
you know, very eager to, to set up conversations where, where we can. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, thanks again for your time. Uh, and thanks again for staying with us for the extra five minutes. And um, have a good day. Thank you.